I don't know if you remember the Sierra text adventure games like King's Quest or Space Quest. Um, but um, I don't have first-hand experience. But so, I, so these I, are the text I, games where you'd be like, get knife. And then it'd be like, I don't understand what knife is. And then you'd have to be like, get dagger. And then it would be like, I got the dagger. And you'd walk around with this very old bitmapped animation. So these were in the early 80s. Kind of um, like talking to a, a bank, you know, calling. Yeah, order, like, right? like one of those <laughs> bad space systems, right? So, so these text adventure games, uh, I remember they, they just came out as a, a right, after, right after I was born. And um, I sit and I play them with my dad. And, um, and on the basis of playing these computer games, I actually learned to read and write before I entered school, um, just because um, by playing and actually reading on the screen and having this interactive process that was very driven to not have my dad in the loop, to be able to play the games by myself, I, I just ended up learning to read and write, so. That's, now, okay, so, so. So computers were always a part of my life. I'm a hacker born and bred. Um, I started coding in C around, uh, when I was around 10 years old, um, just face glued to the computer screen all the time. And, um, and, I, and it turns out that I'm, I'm like, I, I just really enjoyed doing it. I like coding uh, under pressure, coding things correctly. I represented the United States uh, in the uh, computer programming Olympiad in high school. Uh, when I went to Harvard, I was on the computer programming team there. We got eighth place in the world. I think that's pretty good. Um, and uh, and then after after I um, after I graduated Harvard, I was like, well, what do I want to do? Um, wh what do I think is interesting? And I've always been drawn to what I think is the most applied. And for me at the time, I took a class uh, from a, a bright young professor, Dan Malamed, and I was like, and he taught about uh, statistical and data-driven natural language processing. And I was like, this, this is important. This data-driven approach is, I think, going to be uh, very important. I want to learn about it. This is the right way to do artificial intelligence, to use a lot of data, to use a lot of statistics. This is what I want to learn. And I studied under Dan, um, and, um, and I, I started focusing on natural language processing. But I realized I was, I was not so interested in the linguistics, per se, but more the, the, the large-scale machine learning behind it. Uh, my approach has always been, you know, you can always sit down and take a human and put him in the loop and start engineering and do, doing, doing the manual engineering, but that can only get you so far. What you really want is approaches that are very automatic um, and general purpose because then they have the most widespread applicability. So I've always been pushing in, in my research to try and take a step back and do the most general thing possible. Um, when I submitted my thesis in 2006, I read about this, um, I read this tech report, it hadn't been published yet, about this uh, wacky new thing called deep learning. And deep learning, it was a um, highly ambitious attempt to move us closer to artificial intelligence. But not only that, it was methodical and elegant and it worked. And I was like, I think deep learning is what I really want to focus my energy on. I spoke to, the, 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 at this time, there are only three labs in the world working on it. I spoke to uh, all three of them and I decided I wanted to go to Montreal uh, and learn about it. I spent the past three years in Montreal with Professor Yasho Bengio, studying deep learning uh, with especially applications to language processing, text analysis, and, uh, and it turns out, it turns out that these three guys were right. Um, deep learning um, is now the next big thing in machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, it's uh, 300 researchers uh, showed up at a workshop on it, uh, which is very big considering the size of the community, the academic community. Uh, DARPA and NSF are now funding initiatives in deep learning. And, uh, and I think they're right. I think that it's kind of like how support vector machines, SVMs, were very popular like five or 10 years ago. This deep learning thing is gonna have a huge impact coming out. So, so AI is sort of coming back. I mean, when I was a, a child, there was, there was sort of this big AI push, but it right. just didn't work. Right, you know? so, so that's so, the thing, right? So we all got that, disillusioned. Exactly. Is that how? Exactly. So, so, so what's old is new again, right? Um, so, so, so because, Thank because you. yeah, <laughs> thanks. You're, you're um, I hope, I hope it's still the case. Um, so, so, in in the fifties and sixties, there were a lot of wild claims being made. Oh, just give us ten or twenty years, we'll solve this whole AI thing. We'll have like talking robots, and they'll drive for you. Yada yada yada. Mm. Right. Um, and when. Uh, and they overpromised and underdelivered. And when it didn't work, everyone really became disillusioned, and AI became a dirty word. And it, and it, and it was for a very long time. And um, I think due to the efforts of certain researchers who said, okay, you know what, like, it's time to stop, like, like, 
but it's time to stop just looking at um, um, just models and approaches that we know can't solve AI, right? Let's, let's like, we know we're not gonna solve AI in the next five or 10 years, but let's at least start trying things that can, can plausibly move us forward towards AI instead of just, uh, uh, just refining things that we know will never move us closer to AI. Um, and, and, and that's what they did, um, applying, I think, uh, uh, methodological uh, and, and scientific practice um, to, to actually moving fo closer to this goal. And, and it does actually, it has, a, it has immediate applications in industry. That's a, that, was, that was the essence of my trial talk, is what, what, what's uh, on the horizon uh, that you could apply in industry right now, but you just haven't heard of yet. So your talk actually was the buzz of today. So, I mean, it was a packed house. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of problems with AI. One is that it's expensive, right, to, yeah. to, to research and actually to maintain. So where is that funding coming from? Is that going to be private or is it going to be government? So I think, um, well, I, I, you know, honestly, it, it's one of these things that early on, I think it's, it's, it's a... Um, as with anything new, um, you know, only only uh, only people that are either very dedicated to it or have a lot of resources mm -hmm. can take advantage of it and then get a head start. Um, but recently, there's been a lot more interest, and uh, I think that with uh, honestly, I'm I'm a big advocate of open notebook science and mm -hmm. code sharing. Uh, I always share my code, so when people start sharing code, I think that's when. Uh, when it really starts making making more waves, um, also just recognition um, more widely in industry. I mean, that that was one of the reasons it was important to me to come and speak at Strata Conference about about these things. So the economic driving forces, uh, when it comes to marketing, we've known who you were, we know what you did, but we didn't know why you did it. Sure. So as it comes down into that me aspect, AI and natural language processing, actually is kind of moving forward of the intention base. Uh, actions. So th that that's one approach. There, there also the the other thing is that these techniques, like you could take um, a lot of existing problems. Um, you know, say like risk analysis, mm -hmm. which is something the machine learning is very commonly applied to, um, and you could take these deep learning approaches and actually get higher accuracy. Mm -hmm. So you can use it um, not just to try and tackle new problems, which I think is more speculative and risky, mm -hmm. but also perhaps more opportunistic if, if you want to really try and push the envelope. You could also just take what you're working on right now and then try and improve it and make it more sophisticated. Now, I'm at, l let me say one thing. I'm actually an advocate of use the simplest thing possible. Okay? Sure. If, if what you're doing right now works okay, don't change it, right? Okay. Only if uh, you're seeing like diminishing returns from big data. Mm -hmm. um, all your competitors are using big data, and then you need to eke out more of a competitive advantage because big data is no longer an advantage. Um, that's when you'd start using a more sophisticated algorithm. Um, so it, it, you should only really do it if it's going to provide uh, a qualitative improvement to your product. I'm not an advocate of, of just use the, the newfangled thing. So a lot of it is also threat assessment, property, mm -hmm. um, um, relief. So let's say wildfire modeling, earthquake modeling, and one of the things that natural language is helping with is moving that forward because we can take pre-existing data sets mm -hmm. for days, but what's the randomness of data? Right. So is that something that you're interested in is the randomness of data? Um, could you restate the question? Sure. So uh, data as, uh, has a... Um, has laws that we abide to. We mm -hmm. can understand what's happened. What we're trying to understand with AI is what might happen. So mm -hmm. randomness of data, how do you enter that into it? Yeah, so um, it, it seems like there, there are two parts to this question. One, um, there's this question of what do you do with time series? Mm -hmm. And this, this is still a very active question. Um, so I can't, I can't really comment too much on that. Um, but the interesting thing uh, about these new approaches is that they're really based on trying to find as much structure and pattern and signal in the data is possible. And that's essentially uh, what, what has driven these algorithms forward, trying to find structure and then using this structure and these patterns to actually uh, enhance the predictive ability. Yeah. So what do you what do you make of IBM Watson? Right, I mean, sort of an interesting project. You, you've seen it, obviously. I mean, I, I yeah. think. Um, okay, so, this whole so so I, I I'm of I'm of two opinions. Um, so so on the one hand, um, I you know as I said, my approach is. Um, always do the most general thing and really try and take a step back 
and, and take humans out of the loop and really push that as far as possible. Yeah. So, you know, their, their approach is different. They, they're actually using a lot of human engineering, right? But then on the other hand, when you're talking about the real world, what you do is you take a general purpose approach and then you start adding humans into the loop to get that extra mile. So in that sense, I think it's really interesting to see, well, how far they can, can they push it? Mm -hmm. Because that's the, that's the real question. What is the upper bound right now? How far can they take it? And I think, I think it's great to see that in industry. So are you following any of the work at the Kurzweil uh, Institute? I mean, what, what are your thoughts on, on obviously, what he's, he's put forth over and over is different than what I believe is AI? Um, I'm not familiar enough with his work to comment on it in a serious way. Okay. Yeah. So uh, obviously the idea of singularity, right? Yeah. Uh, the idea of singularity, I think, is much different than the actual performance or um, validity of AI. Mm -hmm. So how do you know when it's ready as far as uh, application? Um, I guess I'm, I'm very much of, I'm very much uh, user driven. Mm -hmm. um, so my approach is really if it satisfies a user need, um, if it actually creates value mm -hmm. for people, then it's ready. Um, and and a lot of the time, that doesn't mean artificial intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. It just means maybe something that works good enough on a specific problem. So it, when basically when the users say that they like it is, is, is my answer. You're, you're thinking five years right now. Is it kind of a goal of, it depends or a what milestone? Well, it depends on what problem we're talking about, okay. right? Um, so sentiment analysis right mm -hmm. now. Um, a lot of people are working on it. My impression is that it's not actually that good. Um, maybe uh, for a qualitatively, imp like qualitative improvement in sentiment analysis, a few years. Um, I'm also I'm also an optimist. You know, if you were to ask me when are we going to have like robot cars, my I I would say, you know, ten years. But I'm an optimist. So that, yeah. that's that's for full for. Full automation for some automation, we're almost there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we're so, Joseph, where do you go from here? You've been doing this, uh, all this research, you've been you know, like, like sucking up all this great information. Now, what do you want to do? What, right. What so, about uh, Joseph, so, where, so where's doing, he going? I was doing, um, I was doing my uh, postdoc for three years in Montreal, as I said, and f from my perspective, I always really wanted to build applications and um, and put things into practice. So for me, the, the postdoc was really just sharpening my knives. And ready, now I'm ready to eat some steak. Um, I, uh, I recently quit my academic post. Um, I've been uh, doing a consultancy. Um, essentially, I consult on when there's a large scale machine learning or natural language processing question, or for that matter, you want to take your data and monetize it. Um, that's my sweet spot. Um, in general, I'll decline gigs unless they're of particular strategic importance to, to my consultancy because I've identified a certain class of problems that I consider uh, of particular importance and utility. Um, so I'm, I'm now consulting full time. Um, there's actually um, one of the main problems I'm working on is if you have a very large unstructured collection of information, text, documents, um, you know, patent, something like that, and you want to organize it, you want to make it navigable, you want to make it explorable, how do you do that? Um, so that's one of the products that I'm licensing right now. So, so if people want more information about you, and, and I mean, how can sure. they follow you? Where, where can they go? I mean, sure. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you can always, um, you can always just send me an email. Um, just Google me, and it'll be easy to figure out my email address. Um, besides that, um, I, I wanted to point out. So, so I started um, a Q and A form. If people actually have questions about machine learning, natural language processing, big data, uh, I started a Q and A forum called. Uh, it's the Meta Optim. That's the name of my company. Um, Meta Optimized Q and A forum. And um, and so, if you had a question like, what clustering algorithm should I use? There's a lot of folk wisdom. Uh, that, that hasn't been commonly shared, and now there's actually a forum for people to come together. Um, it's actually uh, incredibly popular both in academia and industry. It's got a large mind share among people that do machine learning, natural language processing. Uh, it's, an, it's a tremendous resource. Um, so, so that's one thing I just wanted to put out to the audience. If you have questions about this sort of thing, that's the right form. In fact, I think it's the most popular 
forum for machine learning, natural language processing, big data on the web right now. So we're here with Joseph Turian, um, really interesting discussion. Let me tell you what I've learned here, yeah. in addition to many things. Uh, forget books, you fire up the laptop and start coding. Right? Well, I, I agree, so, and, then, and then hopefully sorry, we'll come back. Sorry, honey. Yeah. I got four kids. And, go for it. You know, that's, uh, go ahead, you were gonna say. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think, I think coding's great, but I also love paper. Uh, I love, so, oh, good, so, so you read as a child as well. Oh, yeah, well. of course. Right. Terrific. I, I, think, I think, you know, I mean, it you, wasn't you, just, you, you, you can't beat something tactile. You can't right. beat something you can hold. Uh, I agree, hands, okay. Know? So, okay, good, so, so don't forget books, but, yeah. but definitely fire up the laptop and start coding. Support vector machines, been there, done oh, let me, that. Let me make one more comment about coding. <laughs> okay, so I've, I've always, I've always, I've been saying this to my friends recently, that, um, that basically, like, if, if, I really feel like if you can't code nowadays, it's like being in the 18th century and not being able to fence. You know, it's like it, it, was, it was one of these things that maybe you could get on with your life and not be able to fence, but you really—it's a skill you really should have. You know, if you if you if you want to be able to like, like, well, yeah, okay. essentially. Now, support the, your comment about SVM was really interesting to okay. me. I first heard, I first learned about them probably right. about three years ago. And it basically, that was old news by then for, yeah. for guys like you. And I, I was hoping that it would solve a data classification problem, but it no. really hasn't. But anyway, and then AI, John, old is new. Okay, so there's there's hope. Um, find ways to make qualitative improvements to products and, and presumably lives. Yeah. And, and when the user loves it, you're there. Yeah. Right? And then uh, Google Joseph Turian uh, if you want more information. And check out the meta-optimized Q&A forum. Yeah. Uh, sounds like a, a great resource for people. So uh, great. All right, we so got our next.